Hello, I am uh, Jeff Spence from Jefferson's Office of Alumni Relations, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to learn about Workday Wellness this afternoon. I hope that you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. Obviously, wellness has never been more top of mind than it is to, in today's evolving global environment. And I hope you will leave today's talk with new insights on improving your day-to-day -day wellness. When we begin our presentation, please share any questions you have for our speaker by using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. We will address questions at the end of the talk and we'll do our best to share as many as time allows. We are excited to have a diverse group of Jefferson Textile and Philly University alumni joining us today from various academic and clinical programs and in 15 states. We're also lucky to have Dr. Dina Nobleza as our presenter today. Dr. Nobleza is the director of the Student Personal Counseling Center in the Emotional Health and Wellness Program for House Staff at Jefferson. She's also a member of the faculty of the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. She received her medical degree from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, where she also completed a combined residency in internal medicine and psychiatry. Upon completing residency, she became board certified in both specialties, remained on the faculty with a joint appointment in the departments of internal medicine and psychiatry, and provided care for patients with severe and persistent mental illness. In 2005, Dr. Nobleza transitioned to college mental health, becoming the first staff psychiatrist at Princeton University and in 2010, joining the faculty here at Jefferson. Before we begin our talk, we wanna share some information on upcoming events and webinars. Our wellness webinar series will continue later today with two additional talks. At 2.30 p.m., Dr. Tim Mooney will discuss planning for retirement, no matter where you are in your career or your savings. Then this evening, Dr. Raina Marino will explore and compare the potential health benefits of plant-based and paleo diets. Later this month, Dr. Rob Franks from the Sports Concussion Program at the Rothman Orthopedic Institute will share ways to identify and prevent concussions, a perfect talk for athletes as well as their family, friends, and parents. Then in May, we'll explore how modern immunotherapy, research, and trials are advancing the fight against cancer. Then tentatively in June, we are planning a special evening at the Museum of the American Revolution here in Philadelphia where Dr. Evan Lane of Jefferson's Law and Society program will discuss the political conspiracies that have shaped American history. More information on that event will be forthcoming once we are um, lifted from our stay-at-home orders here in Philadelphia. We also encourage you to save the dates for homecoming on October 2nd and 3rd, and for our Medical College Alumni Weekend on October 16th and 17th. More information on both events will be coming soon, and if your class year ends in a 05 and you would be interested in joining your reunion committee, please reach out to us at alumni at jefferson.edu. Lastly, before we begin our talk, I hope that you have seen and received information on Jefferson's COVID-19 Better Together Fund. This special fund has been established to provide support from the Jefferson community to ensure our students and employees are able to adapt to the ever-changing circumstances the COVID-19 pandemic has presented urge all alumni to consider a gift to support this important initiative, which provides emergency assistance to Jefferson students and employees. As of this morning, generous benefactors have contributed more than $1.9 million in gifts and matching contributions to the COVID-19 Better Together Fund. And Bob Lockyer of the class of 1968 and his wife, Carol, have committed $7,500 to the fund once 100 alumni make a gift. And now it is my pleasure to pass the baton off to Dr. Dina Nobleza to talk with each of you about Workday Wellness in this unprecedented time. Dr. Nobleza, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. I'm just gonna share my screen here and pull up my slides. You can see those, yeah. the head nod from Jeffrey. Great, and everyone, you can hear me okay? So uh, I just wanna thank you for inviting me to speak with the alumni today, Jeffrey. You know, I was reflecting back to when you approached me to have this, have this talk, and it was the end of February, and um, you know, you had 
come to ask for me to speak on wellness in the workplace. At that time, it was really just an easy yes for me, right? I'm a psychiatrist here at Jefferson. I'm often asked to speak to students, faculty, and staff on topics of burnout and ways to combat that. But it's just, my gosh, right, a month later, how much, um, how much for all of us work looks very different for many of us like it did just a month ago. One of the terms that I've been hearing a lot in the news and from people is this word unprecedented. It's defined as never done or known before. And it's, it's just interesting to take a moment to reflect about the things that we're doing now that, that we have never done before, things that we would not have imagined doing before. For me, I'll share that th those things are a number of things, but I'll share that I never worked remotely before this period of time. I certainly never conducted therapy sessions from my guest room. I never worried that my grocery store would run out of toilet paper. And I can say that I've never worried more about my colleagues on the front line as much as I do now. I suspect that many of you like me are doing things very differently, not just in your work, but in your life in general. And so I just want to express how I think it's, it's really nice that each of you have taken a moment just to pause amongst this chaos and, and join in learning about how to be well during this unprecedented time. One of the things that I've been talking to uh, a lot of people in my life, not just people who see me for counseling, but um, friends, loved ones, coworkers, is that uh, is the importance of developing a wellness plan. You know, the changes that we're experiencing as a result of this pandemic, we know that it can be stressful, that it provokes anxiety, and such a time really calls for us to be intentional, intentional in thinking about our wellness, being proactive in developing a plan for ourselves, uh, for our families, and thinking holistically about our health and our well being. I'm sure that many of you, like me, are caretakers, uh, have young children, have. Uh, aging parents, maybe your managers, and have uh, workers, coworkers, employees that you also care for. There may be people, neighbors in your community. And we know that the, the best way we're going to be effective to those individuals in helping them is if we're taking care of ourselves. And so it's important to remember that for each of us, a wellness plan is personal. That, you know, I may provide some tips here today, but really that you know what's best for you. And my hope is, you know, I've tried to keep it more on the briefer side, these slides, but my hope is that in this short time together that, uh, that I can provide you just a few wellness tap tips that you might consider integrating into your wellness toolbox, not only to help you stay productive in your work, but to help to keep you well during the most unusual of circumstances. For those of you who are working remotely now, it's easy for the day, I'm sure, as you may have realized, to become unstructured. And so, you know, my first step is to maintain a routine. So, you know, in general, when there are aspects of our lives that are seemingly out of our locus of control and um, yeah just out of our control it can be really grounding and stabilizing for us to control those aspects of our of our lives that we we do have or that we can control i'm sure my my son isn't appreciating this this time <laughs> i have an 11 year old um some i'm you know 
on, on top of his schedule and managing his schedule a little bit more. But that's something that I have a bit of control over. Um, and so it's important not only to keep a schedule for yourselves, you know, maybe keep a schedule for your families, for children. You know, it, it helps them to feel, um, you know, uh, structured and boundaried. And so we do our best to maintain a routine. You know, so what we do is we do our best to wake up around the same time every morning, even if you're not leaving the house, to take a shower, do our morning routine, get ready as you would normally, eat regular meals around the same time, uh, incorporate a workout, go for a walk, you know, make sure that you're keeping regular sleeping hours especially is an important one. Another thing that you may have noticed if you are working remotely is that uh, work-life boundaries become blurred. Uh, I think even during this period of time, even if you're not working remotely, you'll notice that, uh, right, work, the end of work uh, is maybe getting more into, uh, into your life. You know, when you're at the office, it's clear uh, when your shift or your day is ending, you know, people start to filter out, filter out, they say their goodbyes, and we don't, we just don't have these cues right now. And so it's easy to lose track of when you should stop working. I, I, I find especially, right, with all this technology, uh, and especially since for many of us, we're on the technology even more, you know, if we don't set those boundaries, then those boundaries become really blurred. So, you know, to the extent that you can counteract this, you should give yourself a target. You know, we should be really intentional that when you start, you know, your start, start your work at the start of the day, choose a time frame when you want to finish your work for that day. Now, of course, something about your day might change and may cause you to step away from working. You know, if you have that toddler that's getting into some mischief or something else comes up. But, you know, we reevaluate, we adjust, but, you know, we still try to keep within a target end time. And so while it is difficult during these times, we're gonna try to do our best to, to stick to a schedule. Another thing we can think about is environmental wellness. You might want to take a look around at your workspaces. You know, how might your workspace be impacting your well being positively or negatively? How might you consider improving your workspace to make it more pleasant, more comfortable, or more conducive to productivity? For those of, those of us who are working from home, it's important to choose a space that's away from your sleep space. You know, as this can, uh, if you're working in your sleep space or near your sleep space, that can lead people pairing a wakeful state or a stressful state with the bed or sleep. So ideally, you pick a room that's not your bedroom and absolutely do not be doing work while sitting in bed. Uh, that's more likely to contribute to problems with insomnia. If you can, pick a room that has a window so that you're getting some of that essential vitamin D. Maybe you might need to need, move some furniture around so that the light isn't streaming on your back, but streaming more within your view, viewpoint. But that can certainly help with our moods. You might want to look around what are on your walls, you know, what's at your desk. Could you put up some artwork, maybe a child's masterpiece to invigorate your work, some plans to add some freshness and life into the room. You could add photos of loved ones during this time of physical distancing to, to facilitate that experience of connection. In our home, we have had to purchase white noise machines. Uh, both my husband and I are both uh, in the mental health profession. And so we place them outside of our, our designated workspaces in order to ensure the confidentiality of conversations. But I'll say that these uh, noise machines are very useful just to lessen noise from others in the home and can help with focus and concentration. This is a big one right now, which is, you know, obviously in this time of social distancing, we need to be really proactive at fostering our relationships. Luckily, you know, the conversations that I've been having, people have been pretty good with this, but 
you know, we have a lot, you know, technology has its pluses and minuses, but thanks to technology, there's a number of ways that we can stay connected. Uh, people starting uh, uh, doing FaceTime with loved ones or Skype, we can start texting chains with our loved ones. I'm sure many of you are using Zoom to stay connected with coworkers. So, you know, we, we need to leverage the technology that we do have to stay connected with, with people in our lives. There are also ways we can stay connected in more creative ways. So as one example, my team members, I've asked them to send me songs that speak to them emotionally during this time. So uh, each week on Friday, I drop a playlist uh, with a song from each one of my team members. And in this way, we connect through music. And with, you know, we also have fun guessing who picked which song. I've noticed that uh, th this particular week's play playlist is a little bit more uh, explicit than the other ones. <laughs> so I think we're all experiencing some of the stress of the remote work. You know, the, the reason why we balance the experience with technology is that, uh, you know, while it can help us connect, we also need to know when to tune out, right? To technology, particularly as it relates to the pandemic. You know, it's important to stay informed. It's important to make sure that we have access to information that's reliable, but we should also be limiting our intake of news and social media, especially if it's contributing to stress and anxiety. I think that uh, for many who, are, who may be working from home, it's very easy to have the news on in the background or um, to be pulling up uh, news articles online, uh, but those, those can get to be rabbit holes, really. And so we really need to set limits. You know, uh, I was reading this book um, called The Organized Mind, where they talk about how, uh, you know, the pings, all the pings and dings of these alerts and text messages that they've been associated with periods of like, uh, like a cessation of breathing for a, a split second, you know, and so, you know, our breath and returning to our breath, we really need to, uh, you know, have our attention and focus and turn off those news alerts, turn, turn off those alerts on your devices, you know, tr visit your trusted news sources, maybe just once a day, twice a day, limit those news shows you watch to one or two a day, but having them streaming all the time is just going to increased levels of anxiety and stress. So, so please put limits on those. This is a big one. You know, this is, this is one of those things where, uh, you know, integrating activities that create positive emotions is something that I talk about often as an antidote to burnout. Uh, you know, in the field of positive psychology, uh, you know, in order to experience well-being, we need positive emotions in our life. Luckily, there's a lot of different types of positive emotions. So we're not just talking about happiness. We're not just talking about contentedness. You know, there's so many different types of positive emotions. There's peace, there's gratitude, there's serenity, pleasure, comfort, inspiration, curiosity, love, passion, more. So as we approach our days, we should actively be seeking out experiences that generate positive emotions in us. There are tons of times in our days where we are uh, you know, called on to make certain decisions. And some of those decisions, right, we could be making different decisions that relate to, oh yeah, this would make me feel better in this situation, or this would create a more positive emotion in, in myself. So for example, when I start my day, you know, I think, what will I wear today that will make me feel comfortable? Obviously, these days are, are very different because uh, I can actually uh, be in some athleisure. <laughs> but um, yeah, we should think about these moments at the start of the day. You know, when I sit down at my computer to do some tasks, I might make myself a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. Could that generate some positive emotions in myself? On particularly stressful days, you know, I'll make time uh, make time to meditate, make sure to make time to meditate. Many of you may already have some familiarity with mindfulness or meditation. You know, it's something that over the last 
several years have, have been increasingly integrated in healthcare. Uh, you know, studies in mindfulness meditation have shown that it can improve anxiety, depression, concentration, our overall well being. You know, there are a number of apps, mobile apps right now, that provide free guided meditations like Headspace. Uh, I used Insight Timer this morning, uh, 10%. So there's so many ones out there, and they don't necessarily require a subscription. You can just uh, do some free guided meditation. I do think this concept of mindfulness, right, about, uh, you know, for those who are familiar with mindfulness, it's about um, being in the present moment uh, without judgment. You know, there's still a lot of unknown. Uh, and if we are overly focused on the future, which we don't know about, you know, I think that it can lead to feelings of anxiety and stress. And so, just remembering right now, I, I have now, I know for sure I have this moment. And so if I focus on this, this moment alone and try to be with it, with my entire being, that it could just help to relieve a little bit of stress. But, you know, perhaps you've tried meditation and it doesn't work for you. You know, I've had plenty of people who I've worked with where, you know, they say, you know, doc, I've tried meditation and it just, you know, just doesn't work. You know, what I found is that each of us is unique in what is rejuvenating, what is nourishing for us, even what is considered meditative. So while for me, the benefit of taking a short hike out in nature may be like equivalent to a, a three day, three days off for you, maybe shooting baskets or listening to heavy metal might do the trick. So, you know, it's important to, uh, to respect, right, what you know what works for you, which is why I've listed a whole bunch of things on this slide. Um, so think about that, you know, think about in the past, what strategies have helped you. Uh, it's likely that those strategies can benefit you now, even if the scenario is, is completely different. And while it may go without saying, you know, we, we do our best to avoid unhealthy behaviors, uh, alcohol or drugs during this period of time, you know, because in the long term, you know, these are behaviors that can worsen mental and physical well-being. That all said, you know, during this time, yeah, there is suffering, you know. Uh, for some of you, there's already been some experience of loss. We've experienced loss of connection, some are experiencing loss of jobs. Uh, some will or have experienced loss of loved ones. When they're suffering, we must remember the need for compassion in our lives. And when I think about compassion, it's compassion for others, certainly, but it's also uh, compassion for the self. The word compassion is from Latin. It means co-suffering. And so when we experience suffering in our lives, it's always important to remember that we're never suffering alone. When we remember compassion, when there's suffering, we remember the benefit of reaching out to others. Uh, we, we give people the benefit of the doubt you know, when they're feeling cranky or acting not like themselves. We recognize when other people might need some support. We recognize when we might need to ask for help. And so, you know, we can be mindful that uh, we, need, we might need to recommend some, um, some counseling for ourselves, some counseling for others. If we're managers, we become aware of the resources available uh, to to our coworkers, ourselves, our loved ones, you know, we, we are there for ourselves and we're there for other people. And so we think about how we can help each other. Uh, we help others in need during this time, those experiencing job loss, elderly in our communities, our healthcare providers. Positive psychology um, also talks about how things like random acts of kindness and charity have been shown to contribute to positive emotions and uh, improve well-being.
And lastly, you know, the last tip I have is about expression of gratitude and, and thinking about the things in our lives that we're thankful for. So, you know, gratitude is a helpful exercise uh, that's been linked to well-being and happiness. We can practice gratitude by writing down three things we are grateful for at the start of the day or at the end of the day. We can, uh, you know, write letters or send communication to people in our lives that we're grateful for. Uh, so it's, it is, especially during a time like this, it's, um, it's important to reflect a bit on the things that are going well or things that people in, in our lives that we love. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to end just by extending my gratitude uh, to to the healthcare providers at Jefferson Health and and all the healthcare workers and employees who uh, continue to provide the much needed care to our communities under really the most stressful of circumstances. You know, for them, you know, maintaining routine uh, self care uh, it's more challenging, certainly. You know, to any any of those. Uh, across the nation who are listening, who are in healthcare, to the extent that you can, uh, you know, remember to stay nourished, to get rest, to stay connected. And if you can, take one mindful moment a day that's just for you. A simple exercise to, to promote the relaxation response is, is you know, taking a, a mindful abdominal breath, uh, doing some box breathing or, taking an inhale for four seconds, holding it for seven seconds, and then releasing it for four seconds. Uh, you know, we know that it's, it's um, a much greater challenge, but we, we, we are with you and we appreciate all that, that you're doing to save lives. And so that really concludes my sort of main wellness tips. Uh, I'll send things back over to Jeff and check in if there are any questions for the group. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Nobleza. If anyone has any questions, please um, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we will um, share them. In the meantime, um, Doctor, if, would you be able to expand upon the thoughts of what should people anticipate um, psychologically and emotionally when we approach sort of re-entry uh, from this post-COVID era? That's a great question. You know, I think that um, we can anticipate that it's, um, you know, adjustment, just adjustment and change in general. It brings up a lot of different kinds of emotions. And I think we, we are all unique. And so, you know, certainly there's going to be some experience of, uh, for many people, some experience of uh, positive emotion, right? Being able to connect in that way intimately with people, um, or you know, with all this physical distancing, we've been we've been so separated, and so uh, integrating back into our communities, there will be some positive emotions associated with that. But I think um, there is this concept of that it'll be a new kind of normal, right? That there will be different kinds of experiences that are, and feelings that are still present. You know, feelings of, you know, anxiety. Can I shake hands? Can I not shake hands now? Um, how close should I stay to people? Um, you know, how, how has this affected job life, uh, work life? Um, and so I think I anticipate that that we should prepare in some ways that uh, people will have different emotions with reintegration uh, that span, you know, span things emotionally, which is why I think, you know, this discussion today about the importance of how do we take care of, us, of ourselves? How do we pay attention to our wellness is important because in a fantasy, we could say, oh, yeah, it's going to, you know, we'll go back in there and it'll be great and things are going to be like they used to. But I, I do think it, it's, it won't be going back to normal in the sense of everything's going to be exactly the same, right? Things will be different. We, 
we might need to prepare ourselves that it will feel different. And we may also anticipate that, um, well, yeah, there's a lot that would be great. There will also be, have been some experiences of trauma in this experience and loss. Absolutely. Thank you. We have a few questions from our attendees. Uh, one asks, William asks, as for those who are essential personnel that are making the trip into hospitals, medical related facilities, are there any specific tips for them to decompress after the stress of that work and returning home? Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, I think that, you know, it can be, it can be really difficult, obviously to um, leave work at work. Um, and, and I, you know, I understand that. Sometimes we can, you know, create even, as I was saying before about the importance of like, there are things that are out of control, are our control, and there are things that we might be able to control. And so sometimes it's, it, it can be even, things that we create in a ritualistic way, you know, uh, for ourselves, whether that's, um, because, you know, sometimes when I think about, for example, compartmentalizing that term, um, that often sometimes people talk to me about it, you know, as a psychiatrist, as something that is um, almost as if it has a negative connotation. And when I think about you know, these things that we use, um, you know, we use them also in ways that are healthy because we're trying to, you know, make sure that we are uh, protecting ourselves, protecting our families from, from traumas uh, that we might experience in, in our roles as healthcare providers. And so sometimes we have a ritual, we might need to create a ritual of, this is the end of my work, um, time and I'm ent entering my off time and what can I do in that moment to create a space so you know when I say like a mindful moment certainly we could do that um, but there might be other things that we do ritualistically and right it could be as simple as okay I'm going to you know make myself a cup of tea and sit or I'm you know for some people it may be I'm going to watch this uh, you know, particularly health, uh, humorous show on Netflix that really generates some positive emotions in myself. Um, but we try to find those things that help us to give us some separation. I think there's also the aspect of leaning on our communities. And it may be that uh, those that are sharing that experience with us it might be really important to connect with, whether that's people who are in our exact units and teams, or it might be speaking to somebody who's not, who's outside of even your institution. But being, being able to connect on shared experiences is really important, especially in this experience of the pandemic and being a healthcare provider. So for example, here at Jefferson, we've been talking about um, support groups for the healthcare providers um, that would be facilitated by um, you know, some of my, people on my team, some healthcare professionals, so that people can gather in a community to talk a little bit about um, almost like an emotional debriefing or some sharing and that the community comes together and then lifts each other up. And so um, other things are things like, um, Certainly things like affirmations can be helpful, mantras, things to just sort of create a space between the end of the work shift and then entering the out of work shift. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, Pat asks if you have any sleep tips, any tips for improving sleep behavior and patterns? Yeah, yeah. Great, great question. So improving sleep. So, Lots of things we can do to, um, to get better sleep. Uh, if we are having problems sleeping, um, making sure that we are omitting anything that is uh, 
stimulating or a stimulant, right? So if we drink caffeine, we might need to reduce our caffeine, minimize it or cut it out completely. Um, we should not be doing things that um, also can increase our adrenaline um, or catecholamines like uh, working out too late at night. Uh, we could reserve those for kind of morning activities, so early morning activities. But once you get to closer to bedtime, we should be avoiding working out or engaging in some of that physical activity. Um, you know, nighttime rituals are important. So, you know, there are these cues. We're, I was talking about environmental cues before, but we can develop cues for nighttime. So if we've noticed that we've always had, uh, ha we have a hard time sleeping, we might start, you know, an hour before, you know, trying to create a ritual, whether that's, you know, again, a cup of tea, decreasing the lights in the house, um, sitting down with a book. You know, again, you're not wanting probably to be watching uh, stimulating, anxiety-provoking news at the end of the night. Uh, we know that um, access to those blue screens on our computers and our telephones, uh, if we are using those in the nighttime, those are also going to negatively impact sleep. So we should be really trying to get away from our technology, uh, you know, again, with enough time before uh, having our nighttime ritual. So those are, you know, and, and like I said, you shouldn't be pairing the bed with anything else. So, you know, you shouldn't be watching TV in bed. You shouldn't be doing work in bed. Really, it should be, you wake up in the morning, you leave your bed, and then, you know, you're only going back to, you know, the bedroom at the end of the night when you're wanting to go to sleep. Any Anytime you're doing other tasks, like, you know, um, in the bed, you're pairing it with wakeful activities. So those are, and avoiding alcohol um, at night too. Al alcohol is one of those things where uh, people may notice that it helps them sleep. Um, but what happens is as alcohol sort of leaves the system, um, people get a surge of, um, you know, stimulating chemicals, catecholamines and things like that, which then produce wakefulness in the middle of the night. So, you know, nighttime cocktails uh, are no, no. Another question we have, um, are there any online influencers that you have found to be particularly helpful with um, that provide either daily or weekly tips on mindfulness or gratitude, stress release, things of that nature? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, so I just started a social media account for the first time uh, in, I think it was 20, this, it was the start of 2019. So I am not someone who follows online influencers. That being said, um, you know, I'll put a plug for the Jefferson Counseling Services. Uh, uh, we have a web, um, an Instagram account uh, where they're actually, one of our counselors just uh, posted a mindfulness meditation on there. Uh, there are these mobile applications currently that are offering these free subscriptions. So again, for the healthcare providers, uh, there are this 10% happier and Headspace are offering, it's like six months or more, free subscription to those applications. So if you think you might want to, and they, they don't just do meditation for that. So for example, the 10% Happier website has uh, a COVID-19, they have these streaming videos where people are talking about how to manage anxiety, how to manage stress during the COVID-19 pandemic. So you might want to check check that out. I would say um, if there are things that you enjoy, so for example, if there's a hobby, um, maybe if, if there's a sport or, um, you know, a certain, it could be reading, it could be any particular thing that you enjoy. And there are communities that, uh, for example, on YouTube or on Instagram that are based around those communities that would generate positive emotions in you, then you might consider sort of, you know, developing or following those um, Instagrammers or, um, 
you know, setting up an, an account so you can sort of post things that would generate some positive emotion. Wonderful. Well, no, there seems to be no additional questions. So thank you once again, Dr. Nobleza. Um, this has been a wonderful and informative uh, talk for all of us. And if I will just pull on my thank you screen here. Apologies for this. Um, so yes, thank you. And thank you to everybody who has joined us this afternoon. I hope you'll join us later today to continue our wellness conversations. You can sign up at any time at jefferson.edu slash alumni events. And look for a link uh, in your email to support Jefferson's COVID-19 Better Together Fund. You can also visit jefferson.edu slash COVID funding to make your gift now. Thank you in advance for your support of our Jefferson students and employees at this critical time. And until later today, thank you. Please stay well and safe. Thank you. Thank you.